Hey everyone, I know this is about the 754th Artemis 1 launch video, but I'm going to throw my FOMO version into the pile anyway, and we'll see if there's any interest in a little narration. Plus, it's good practice for me. A few of these launch replays were released within about a week of the launch on November 16th, 2022, but due to export control and other secrecy restrictions, more comprehensive sets of replays from the operational TV cameras, or OTV for short, were not published by NASA until February 2nd, 2023, over two months later. Unfortunately, none of the NASA programs are fully public anymore. Replays from OTV cameras on the Mobile Launcher Platform, or DEC, from the ML Umbilical Tower, from the immediate pad area, and the pad perimeter were released together on that date. That release also included some tracking cameras located around the Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral Space Force Station and edited video from onboard exterior cameras. If you are interested in going through these videos yourself, in some cases at higher resolution, they are all available for download from NASA at their images.nasa.gov website the Agency Video Audio Image Library, or AVAIL for short. A couple of months later, just about a year ago now, in mid-April 2023, launch replays shot from film cameras in many of the same general locations were also released, and those should also still be available via nasa.gov. Just about the shortest set of replays was from the set of cameras on the mobile launcher deck, and that's what I'm going to go through in this derivative video. The first replay in this collection is from OTV Camera 805. Note that as released, these are all slowed down to maybe half time. This is in kind of the northwest corner of the mobile launcher deck slash platform looking towards the southeast. We obviously have this rainbird in our immediate foreground on the left, and we're looking at kind of the back side of the vehicle with the left hand SRB nearest to the camera. The time tag is in the lower left and the mission elapsed time is in the lower right. Those are measured down to the millisecond, but we don't have anything to correlate those with, so they are some shade of approximate, I guess. Around the SRB are the vehicle support posts with the number 8 one fully in view in this angle. To the left of that is the aft skirt electrical umbilical in between the two vehicle support posts on the back side here. One of the functions of that umbilical, there's one for each SRB, is to relay the SRB ignition signal from the vehicle-based SLS flight computers to the ground-based launch release system. SLS commits to flight when it issues the Fire 2 command, which first goes to the left and right booster ignition system. That fires the igniters that start both boosters, and once that happens, the vehicle will be moving. As the boosters are taking that signal and firing the igniters, they also relay it down the electrical path of the SRB systems tunnel to the aft skirt electrical umbilical. That signal is passed to the launch release system and is the Q2, as the name implies, release the vehicle. There are several T0 umbilicals and most of those must release and retract away from Orion and SLS. As we roll this for a few seconds, from this angle we can see exhaust puffs from the left SRB hydraulic power unit or HPU. Those are started at T-28 seconds just after the SLS flight computers begin the autonomous launch sequence at T-30 seconds. NASA Spaceflight was one of the few live streams to catch HPU start during the live launch coverage, and unfortunately these replays don't go back that far, because all of these zero-deck cameras would show it. But we can see this booster HPU chugging here a little bit. Some of the other activity is easier to see from the other cameras. And this one gets obscured as the ignition overpressure protection sound suppression system water begins to flow. We see the hydrogen burn-off igniters or H buoys start at T-12 seconds. The water starts flowing through the rainbirds. And there goes our situational awareness at least good situational awareness. You can kind of see the initial red exhaust as the RS-25s start intentionally hydrogen rich, and that becomes more bluish as the four engines come up to main stage. But those are indirect cues. This doesn't really tell us if the engines are up and running. We just have to wait and see if the boosters start after the engines. And of course on Artemis 1 they did.
The second replay is from OTV Camera 806. This is kind of a mirror of Camera 805, but without a rainbow directly in the field of view. This is the right-hand SRB with vehicle support posts number two and four closest to the camera. You can see one of the banks of stadium lights in the lower left and all the boxy housings for these TV and film cameras to survive the launch sequence well enough to record it throughout. At the outset, we get a quick shot of the exhaust from a couple of core stage APUs or KPUs, at least through two of the four exhaust ports on this side of the engine section bow tail. As the H buoys fire, we see some venting from one of the vent ports on the engine section. We can directly see one of the ports here, but the port where this venting is coming from is out of view. We were pretty busy with live launch coverage or intently watching the terminal countdown during the live event, but looking back at the coverage, we saw this venting quite a bit. The inside of the engine section gets very cold, at least for humans anyway. The cryogenic propellant flowing through all the internal plumbing was expected to drop the temperature in there to around 0 degrees Fahrenheit. All three quote-unquote dry sections of the stage are purged with a heated inert gas, gaseous nitrogen, to control the temperature inside the volume. Usually the purge is just plain old dry air, but when the vehicle is being fueled, they use gaseous nitrogen. While the RS-25 engines like their liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen at just the right low temperature, other things inside don't care for it as much, like avionics boxes or hydraulic fluid. The purge also helps mitigate the risks of a fire in case there was a leak. So anyway, that's a little reminder that the engine section is constantly purged with GN2. That's an asphyxiant and is one of the many reasons that no one is allowed in or around the launch pad during fueling, except for the folks who are going to fly Orion and SLS. We'll come back to the H buoys that fire here, but you can kind of see that there are multiple streams or fans. The ones here that are easier to see are firing up at the KPU exhaust ports, but there are two others that spray across the top of the flame hole. There's a rainbird nearby, even if we can't directly see it, and the pre-lift off water flow obscures things, but not as badly from this point of view. You can see the color of the engine exhaust change from hydrogen E to main stage E, but the way the vehicle squats in the flame hole, we can't see the mock diamonds directly. The last set of butterfly valves for the water deluge are timed to open with liftoff, and we can see that here as the vehicle climbs away from the ML. Next is OTV camera 807, and this is on the southwest side of the mobile launcher deck. At least the southwest side of the mobile launcher deck around the vehicle. This has a view of the plus Z side of SLS, where the tail service masts and those umbilicals and connections are. And it has a better view in some cases of other things. I've labeled a few of the things in this camera view. We can see a little bit of the base of the umbilical tower from here, including a bank of OTV cameras. We're closer to the HPU exhaust ports, and we can see a little bit of that exhaust from the left-hand SRB. We can also see the aft skirt purge umbilical here for the left booster. The curved silvery line provides a GN2 purge of the aft skirt for the hydraulic systems. We're on the west side of the mobile launcher, which is where more of the liquid oxygen fueling systems are, and we're looking at the liquid oxygen tail service mast and umbilical. So a little bit more about the hydrogen burn-off igniters, or H buoys. As noted, the RS-25 engines start fuel-rich, which is typical for engines, well, typical for rocket engines, and both with the space shuttle and SLS, burn-off igniters are used to try to more evenly burn that off, as opposed to letting it accumulate and be ignited all at once or increase the risk of a fire. With the way that this vehicle sits in the flame hole with the engine nozzles right over the top, and with the way the capus work, we're seeing a lot more of the H buoy streams for the capus than the streams for the engines. But we can see both of them here a little better. Cameras up on the tower, which we can also see from this point of view, provide an even better vantage point for that, which we'll come back to later. The more visible streams firing up are for the capus, but we can kind of see the ones to burn off the lead hydrogen for engine start. Those are firing parallel to the ML deck across the top of the flame hole. The free hydrogen, the lead hydrogen, first comes from the engines as they start. 
Capus are running for almost four minutes on the pad using a ground-based gaseous helium spin start system. As the engines come up to main stage, the out pressure from them bypasses the pressure from the helium ground system to drive the capus during flight. And as that happens, the capu exhaust goes from helium to hydrogen gas. The latter needs to be controlled, and that's what one of the HBUI streams is meant for. It's not easy to see, but after the engines start, we can see some reddish flashes that indicate that the capu exhaust is now mostly gaseous hydrogen from the running engines. This camera should be kind of familiar if you remember the Artemis 1 live launch coverage. OTV-808 is the primary public shot of the base of the vehicle that was provided live during the launch attempts. As noted earlier, it did show the booster HPU startup since that expels a big puff of smoke. The replay here starts well after that though. As we can see, this view of the launch sequence is similar to OTV Camera 805. The ramp up of the water deluge mostly obscures the start of the engines, but we can see the bluish color reflected by the water, and we can see the left SRB when the igniters are fired to start the mission. NASA would not provide live coverage of the wet dress rehearsal attempts in April of 2022, but they did for the one in June 2022. In that one, we got OTV Camera 813, which provided a more informative view of the base of the vehicle, especially during the launch sequence. That camera replay was released with the set from the ML Tower, which was also released in February 2023. But we can take a peek here. From this point of view, we can see all three streams or fans of the north side H buoys, and you can see how the ones that are firing across the top of the flame hole are also angled underneath the engine nozzles. From this point of view, it's difficult to see the water from the rainbirds. We can begin to see a little of that splashing up around the flame hole. It's dark, and with the camera settings, it's hard to see the engine shock diamonds here in main stage, but we could see the staggered start of all four engines, with the two out of direct view being reflected. This is just a better, less obstructed slash unobstructed view of the ignition and liftoff sequence when you're trying to see what's happening. I hope we get this for Artemis 2 and going forward, but still don't know why not for Artemis 1 Live, but then it's okay months later. Okay, so this camera doesn't have an on-screen number designation. The overlay says it's a video 5 on the zero level. This was a feed that we got during the launch attempts, and it's a nice shot of the engines and the base heat shield of the core stage. This is from what looks to be in between the two tail service masts as opposed to on one of them, with those structures partially in view in the foreground. The liquid oxygen TSM is on the left, and the liquid hydrogen TSM is on the right. We can see the four Kapu exhaust ports on the boat tail and the engine mounted heat shield blankets that thermally protect the engine power heads and the inside of the engine section. At this point, we can see the Kapu exhaust pulsing while it's still running off the helium spin start system. Once the H buoys fire and we can only see the ones firing up at the Kapu exhaust ports, that washes out this view quite a bit. We see a little bit of the engine start, but it's mostly blocked by structure. OTV camera 810 is a mirror image of camera 807, except on the southeast side of the ML deck. This is the east side of the mobile launcher, which is where the liquid hydrogen fueling systems are. The liquid hydrogen tail service mast and umbilical are the ones in view here, where a lot of the action during the Artemis 1 launch campaign centered. The right hand SRB is also in view here. The aft skirt purge umbilical for that is maybe a little closer to this camera. As the engines start and come up to main stage, we can see how even the H buoy streams are entrained by the running engines. We can again see on this side some reddish flashes of the Kapu exhaust that has now become mostly gaseous hydrogen from the running engines. This is a graphic from a paper posted on the NASA Technical Reports Server, or NTRS, using this camera view to illustrate that. 
The aft skirt electrical umbilical for the right SRB is out of view here, but we can see the aft end of the SRB systems tunnel that runs the length of the booster. One of the first time tests that was executed on the Artemis 1 vehicle back in the vehicle assembly building was an umbilical release and retract test to demonstrate the interaction between the SLS flight computers, the firing chain that runs from those computers up at the top of the core stage through the SRB forward skirts and down the systems tunnel into the aft skirt electrical umbilical and the launch release system. Here's what that URRT test that was run in September 2021 looked like from this camera. This shows the release and retract motion with the vehicle not moving. Thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments if this was a worthwhile diversion. There are a lot of ground-based engineering cameras that recorded the Artemis 1 launch sequence, but some of them malfunctioned and the launch occurred in the middle of the night, which served to further hide some of the details of the launch. NASA has made changes and started testing those in the run-up to Artemis 2, but it remains to be seen what time of day that launch will occur. These SLS launches to the moon for Artemis could launch at any time of the day or night. For the first few missions, which season it occurs will play a major role in that. The main focus on the channel is still on detailed news reporting for the Artemis programs. If you're interested in catching up on that, YouTube will make a link to those news updates appear in the last 20 seconds, if we aren't already there.